But I've certainly had a lot to do with uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee and the issues before it. And I thank many of you in this room uh, who made a difference in what we've undertaken. Ted Gottfried, where are you? Ted grabbed me at the airport, you can usually find me there, and told me several years ago that they were running into problems uh, with the Appellate Defender Project and other projects because too many law students were coming out of school deep in debt and couldn't consider uh, becoming criminal defense attorneys or prosecutors. And Ted inspired me to come up with a bill. And it eventually was named after a gentleman who had um, started this crusade before me, John R. Justice. And the John R. Justice Fellowship Programs now will defer the student debt of those who will commit to at least three years as prosecutors or defenders. Uh, I wish there were a lot more money involved. Let me start off. I wish law school were a heck of a lot cheaper. But uh, it, until it is, I wish there were more money involved to inspire those who want to go into public service. And the idea started right at that table with that man. Ted, you deserve a round of applause. Thank you. It's another issue that I've taken up that might be of interest to you. Well, last November, I was in a restaurant when I got a phone call, uh, and it was the president. And he was calling to wish me happy birthday, uh, to congratulate Loretta and me on our new grandchildren, and to tell me something of great significance, the best gift he could have given me that he had commuted the sentence of a woman from Alton, Illinois, Eugenia Jennings. Eugenia Jennings was a victim of the crack cocaine sentencing disparity. She had been sentenced to 25 years in prison, and um, she'd served 12 of them. She left three children uh, to be raised by her brother. I met her brother at a hearing we had on the crack cocaine sentencing disparity and decided this was a cause worth taking up. Uh, I wanted to bring this where it should be, one to one, but I couldn't. It was at 100 to one for those who follow it, and many do. And we managed to bargain and compromise and compromise back and forth until it came down to 18 to one. Still grossly unfair, but dramatically better than where it was. She was one of those victims, and there are many like her. Well, the bill was signed into law by President Obama after I negotiated it with Jeff, Jeff Sessions of Alabama. You should have seen that. Uh, and Eugenia Jennings was the first commutation that the president offered. And this lady was able to spend Christmas at home with her children. She's fighting cancer and doing OK. Uh, but uh, it really, she became the face of this issue for me, a face from our own home state of Illinois. Go back further in time to service on the committee when Patrick Leahy asked me to co-sponsor a bill to start funding these efforts to use DNA, this new thing called DNA, to see if it could become significant in terms of reviewing the sentencing that had taken place in years before. Little did we know what it would mean, but it's meant a lot. Uh, to some people in this room, very personally meant a lot, but to those of you working in this project, many times that is the hook you were looking for, to find uh, that claim of innocence. And what we see emerging now finally, finally, is a reevaluation of our penal system, long, long overdue. I have a bill in Washington called the Smarter Sentencing Act. And this piece of legislation takes the mandatory minimum federal sentencing and basically on the low end of it, lowers it further, giving the judges more discretion, at least an opportunity in cases, drug offenses without guns or gangs or violence, gives an opportunity for lower sentences. What is amazing about this bill, long overdue after 30 years of getting tough, is the support. You see, in 30 years, we've seen an increase in the federal prison population of 500%. We've seen an increase in the cost of 1,100%. My co-sponsor of this bill is Mike Lee, a Tea Party Republican from Utah. And Mike has been rounding up co-sponsors of the Smarter Sentencing Act on his side of the aisle. He called me and said, I just got Jeff Flake from Arizona. Jeff Flake? Yeah, got him. Wow. He called me shortly thereafter and said, I just got Rand Paul. <laughs> Rand Paul? But hold on. At the committee, when we reported it out at the Judiciary Committee, he said, and I'd like to have unanimous consent to add as a co-sponsor, Ted Cruz. I said, at this point, I'm going to reread this bill. <laughs> <laughs> I 
All kidding aside, we are finally getting out of the shadow of Willie Horton in a national conversation about corrections. And we are finally reaching a point where we're asking some questions long overdue. I've had two hearings that I think may get us started toward moving on the federal basis, what has already happened in the state basis, to start changing dramatically segregation and solitary confinement in the United States. That is long overdue. States that are leading the way, Mississippi is leading the way in reform. We've had the two hearings now, and at each of these hearings, we have had people, one who came to us from death row in Texas after 12 years in solitary confinement, who could barely testify he was such an emotional wreck. And a hearing two months ago, this fellow had uh, been in solitary confinement in Louisiana for 15 years before he was exonerated and released. He's now a truck driver between Minneapolis and Chicago. And we're starting to see finally a conversation, finally a movement. Where did it start? Well, it started in a democracy which entertains new ideas, but it started when the evidence was presented by the Illinois Innocence Project and so many others where there had been miscarriages of justice. Do not underestimate the impact of the people gathered in this room and the impact of this organization, not just on the individuals who are exonerated, finally given their chance, but on our national conversation when it comes to justice. Thank you. I think that the innocence movement can play a big part in rethinking criminal justice in this country, just in terms of, you know, what are we doing? We're locking more people up than the rest of the world. And is this working? And when we have a system with such volume, is there accuracy, not just in our rapes and murders, but in a you know, host of other cases? So I think that you know, we can, you know, on the broadest level, play a role in rethinking criminal justice. And I think there's a lot that the movement has to offer in terms of reforms that will make the system you know, more accurate in terms of who we identify as you know people being who should be prosecuted and convicted so um i think that uh, we have a you know big role to play in terms of reforming you know types of evidence whether it's eyewitness id or confessions or forensics that are entering our courtrooms and really serving as the basis of such critical decisions life or death as somebody being sentenced to death row and you know are just so faulty and so we there's a lot that we could offer in terms of improving the system but i do hope that that the innocence movement you know lends to the larger conversation about just mass incarceration and what we're doing in this country because it just is um it's 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 we've got to change what's going on here i think what's the really really exciting um future for the innocence movement is um, doing a lot more policy work. So, you know, now there are these confirmed cases of people that we know were innocent and were wrongfully convicted. And we can go back and see why and what happened. And you can go back and sort of analyze and, um, you know, figure out what happened. Then you can take that information and then move forward and be progressive and figure out how to keep it from happening in the future. And you know, as someone who's always been on the criminal defense side of things, um, you know, that's a hard place to be because most people don't want to put their money towards initiatives or organizations that help people that get arrested or help people in prison. But that human side and the acknowledgement that wrongful convictions happen make even the most like, you know, law enforcement kind of like you know, conservative person say, well, like, I don't want that to happen. And then that helps everybody. So you get better investigations, you end up with better results, you, you know, it helps to have, um, like, have interrogations be recorded, it helps to have someone do a blind photo lineup, or the person conducting the lineup doesn't know who the suspect is, you know, all of those things are benefiting 
the entire system and they're benefiting society. And it wouldn't happen without all of these documented cases of innocence because no one's out there, you know, waving the flag for people in prison. They just don't have the sympathy in society. And so the innocence movement is uniquely poised to be able to kind of carry that torch and, and those progressive reforms affect everybody. And I think that is really exciting. The phenomenon I would never have believed in when I was a prosecutor, the phenomenon of false confessions. Uh, but uh, it turns out uh, that people under psychological pressure, often people who uh, are being uh, interrogated by officers who are far more intelligent than they, uh, that, that people can um, say things to inculpate themselves that, they, that aren't true. Uh, and uh, as I said, I wouldn't have believed it, uh, but it happens. And uh, one of the great reforms that Tom in particular uh, was responsible for in our Capital Punishment Commission report and that really ought to be widespread throughout the criminal justice system is the videotaping of the interrogation of, uh, of, of murder uh, case suspects. It should be, as I said, broader in application throughout the criminal justice system. Uh, and of course, it's turned out that, that people in law enforcement, many of them love it now because they're done with uh, you know, the totally fallacious motions to suppress uh, statements that, that used to take their time uh, and clutter the justice system and raise doubts about the probity of police officers who went in cases where there was no reason to doubt them. Well, another issue is in terms of, you know, how we document confessions and interrogations in this country. I mean, it's, you know, many police departments still only will bring in a video recorder when um, the, you know, the interrogation process is over and they have a confession. And what's key is what happened in the interrogation process for those hours um, that led up to a confession statement. And so another reform that we push to be implemented is to um, report the entire interrogation process. And, you know, if you just some of the debate that's going on in our country with work for officers wearing body cams, I mean, we're talking about just having an accurate recording of what happened. You know, in this day and age with this technology, we don't need to be a he said, she said. I mean, there are certain circumstances where, you know, it could be a matter of, you know, two people's perspective of what happened, but we certainly don't need it when we're dealing with an interrogation in a police department where the whole process could be videotaped. And in this regard, we have a lot of partnerships with law enforcement. Um, a lot of times the experience that even if there's resistance at the beginning to adopting this reform, once it's in place, people, um, you know, even law enforcement appreciate it because it cuts down on a lot of debate of what happened to the room because there's an objective recording of what transpired. So that's another big area. ADN evidence today um, is good to have it, but also we should pay attention to racism, to uh, profiling, uh, you know, color, it does matter, class, obviously, and um, I mean, there should be a, a, a committee in each state that should challenge the system and make sure that they got the right person. And probably uh, in every single state, they should abolish the death penalty. Because how many people, even some people, uh, they execute it. And then two, three days later, they say, oh, we killed their wrong man. So, you know, that's, that's what I think. They need to step up. You shouldn't have to wait like I did all those years to be exonerated. If your case been overturned, an automatic exoneration should follow. You know, the process of you being compensated should follow. I, you shouldn't have to call me. I shouldn't have to write you or file all these paperwork. It should just happen because that's how the system is supposed to be set up for it to happen, but it's not because it's politically guided. We need to take a lot of politics out of the law, you know, and uh, because it's election season, we're going to go tough on crime. So we just lock up innocent people. I think it's terrible.
the policy issue that I've kind of addressed is like post-conviction issues just because that's what I've been more exposed to and I think it's um, you know what can be tested the um, conservation of some of the evidence is something that we've run into a lot where it's been poorly kept so therefore it's can't be tested again and and for that it's kind of disappointing because here's an opportunity to possibly get someone out of prison but because the evidence was miskept um, and it was kept properly under the statute which is even more sad then they can't be you know you can't confirm their conviction perhaps or release them if they really are innocent I think that's a, a policy avenue that could definitely be addressed is um, is very um, very incomplete um, and very, frankly, not helpful in many areas toward someone who's trying to get work done on the evidence in their case. The law in Illinois says that the evidence must be preserved. It doesn't say how or where or under what conditions it must be preserved. It does say where in terms of it has to be preserved by a law enforcement agency or the circuit clerk. But it doesn't say where in terms of in a refrigerator, in a climate control room or anything along those lines. So literally we encountered cases and we just recently encountered yet another one where the evidence is simply, for lack of a better way to put it, it's all thrown in a box. Um, and it's kept in a room that's not climate controlled. And as we know, heat is the enemy of DNA. And so what I end up with is case after case after case where the lab calls me and says, well, um, we've examined the evidence and it's degraded. Um, and that's uh, and, and that is uh, that's very frustrating because it didn't have to be degraded. I mean, with anything biological, keep it keep it preserved. But it doesn't happen because the law doesn't require it to happen, and that's really really unfortunate. So we are um, in the early stages of attempting to uh, develop um, support for and knowledge of uh, this problem and uh, support for a bill that would ultimately go through that would require at least some evidence from a case to be kept. We encounter, um, for example, I've personally encountered um, sexual assault kits that are kept, you know, where all there's nothing but biological evidence which are kept in non-climate controlled rooms. Let's at least start by keeping those kits climate controlled. And that, that would seem to be a very basic element. And I think if you tell people in society well, they have to keep the evidence, but they could throw it in whatever box they want with whatever other evidence and then put it in a room that reaches 100 degrees. People would say, that, that can't be. Well, it can be. That's what it is. That's what the law is. So evidence preservation is huge to us. Uh, the Innocence Project is a leader in um, reform of how forensic sciences are used in this country. And, you know, that's a big part of our agenda. If you look at, you know, what's been allowed in courtrooms and you know, the report that came out by the NAS a few years ago on um, all of these invalidated forensic sciences and disciplines, you know, bite marks, tool marks, even problems with fingerprint analysis. There's, uh, you know, just has been no scrutiny almost in criminal courts in terms of what has been allowed to go into courts as forensic science. And that is a big part of the Innocence Project's agenda is you know, making sure that this is addressed at a national level and that, you know, there are standards and that, you know, we're not convicting people and sentencing them to death, you know, based on uh, you know, these subjective, unvalidated sciences. Um, there, the Innocence Project played a role in the recent uh, audit by the FBI of all their, you know, large portion of hair comparison cases. And so, you know, making sure and addressing the problems of forensic science is a, a big, uh, big uh, priority for the Innocence Project. We also have, you know, policy department that's focused on working with police departments and legislatures across the country to reform eyewitness identification practices to ensure that people have access to post-conviction testing. Today, all 50 states have laws that uh, provide con some convicted people with access to DNA testing, but many of those laws need to be strengthened. Some only apply to capital defendants. Some require that the convicted person still be in prison, so it doesn't matter if you're um, on parole or you're a convicted sex offender, you don't have a right to access DNA to prove your innocence. So strengthening those laws is a big priority. You know, I think having more standards with 
forensic science and what evidence is scientific evidence is presented to a jury. Um, having the, the scientific communities themselves be more standardized and more consistent throughout the country and just being held to a higher standard really I think is what is really necessary. Um, I also think that the rules of evidence are so in favor of the prosecution and in many ways really hurt someone who's innocent because you know what's the saying like it's impossible to prove a negative like how hard is it to prove that you didn't do something you don't have a burden to prove anything at all so in so many of these cases you have a huge state case and then the defense doesn't put on any evidence at all or you have like an alibi witness or someone from the community who isn't coming in with all these credentials and a PhD after their name and so you know you have a big part of that is that judges are not allowing in, and a lot of times defense attorneys aren't asking to put in evidence from other members of the scientific community or the academic community who can get up on the witness stand and say, yes, you heard testimony from Dr. Smith that that bite mark was Benny's, but jury, you should know that bite mark evidence is speculative and is subjective, and he said it's, it's a match and it can't be, you know, to have more of the adversarial process be present in the presentation of forensic science during trials, I think is really, really important and necessary. And it just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen in many cases because resources are so slim. So if a defendant has hired an attorney, in many cases they have like maxed out, their family's maxed out all the money they can possibly get to hire the best attorney they can get. So they have this really fantastic attorney potentially, but then the attorney says, okay, we need to hire a DNA expert or a blood expert or a biomarker expert to look at this and you know, do our own analysis, our own in independent investigation of that science, and there's no money to do it. So it doesn't happen. Or you have a public defender who's working like crazy and is amazing, but the, the court is not going to have the county pay for the funds it costs to contest the state's evidence when they believe that the expert that's retained by the state is credible and you should just go on what they've said. So there's no adversarial testing a lot of times of the forensics that's presented in a courtroom and the jury gives it so much weight. You know, they call it the CSI factor that juries, you know, they say at some point is going to turn the tide and be, you know, prosecutors are going to sort of feel the burden because they think the juries want to hear more scientific, you know, certainty. Um, but it just doesn't get tested, and so you know I think it's given way too much weight. And the rules of evidence are definitely, definitely slated in favor of the prosecution. But the biggest problem in our criminal justice system uh, since I started and it continues to today is underrepresentation. Um, the American people continue to have an appetite uh, to lock up bad guys, and we can't blame them for that. Um, but they do not understand that justice doesn't come cheap. Uh, we have a process that grants rights uh, to people, and if the gun is ever pointed at you, the gun of the criminal justice system, you understand how important those rights are. Um, Tom used to say to us, um, well, would you think it was fair if you were doing, if somebody was doing that to your brother? And, um, and, and we, we forget that lesson too often. We do not have adequate funds in our system, not just to hire lawyers and our public defenders do an extraordinary job, given how, um, how outmanned they are uh, by the prosecutor's offices and by law enforcement. Uh, but we don't, not only do we not have enough money for lawyers to hire lawyers, but we don't have enough money for investigation. Uh, and uh, I remember when I did a, uh, I think the first thing I did for Tom in the U.S. Attorney's Office was to write a research memo about closing arguments and all the many different ways that the Seventh Circuit had shaken a finger at, at the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Northern District of Illinois. And Tom said, I just wish I could get young lawyers to understand that lawyers don't win cases, facts win cases. And without adequate funds for the investigation of the defense of criminal cases, we will continue to imprison the innocent, notwithstanding uh, the frequent good faith 
of prosecutors and police officers. Uh, and we need to remember uh, that you know, justice does not come cheap, that every time we eliminate funding for defense lawyers, for, inve for investigators, uh, and I know that we are in straitened financial times, but every time we do that, we are voting, as it were, to send innocent people to the penitentiary. Uh, and we need to stop doing that. Uh, we as Americans take no pride in that, uh, and, uh, and we shouldn't. Some prosecutors are fantastic and are just as interested and excited to get the test results as we are, and then some are so recalcitrant and fight us tooth and nail, and like I said, it takes seven years just to get testing. It's just, you know, and even when we get test results back, a lot of times, you know, the first step is for the prosecutor's office to say, how can we reconcile these DNA test results with the person still being guilty? And it's only when there's no way to reconcile it with guilt that they'll agree to vacating the conviction. So it's tough, and I think a lot of it is just mindset. It's very jurisdiction by jurisdiction. And I think a lot depends upon the leadership. You know, for years, Texas was just an awful place, right? to, you know, litigate innocence claims, to try to get relief for convicted defendants. And then, you know, a few things have happened. In Dallas County, you had Craig Watkins um, be elected district attorney, and he, you know, agreed to DNA testing and created a conviction integrity unit that was really committed to evaluating innocence claims. We've seen it in New York and Brooklyn with um, district attorney Ken Thompson, who's created a conviction integrity unit based on um, you know, initially a detective who had been fabricating confessions, and they started looking into those cases, but, you know, others too. And of the first 30 cases that they reviewed, they had 10 exonerations. And so, you know, I think it really depends upon if you're, if the leadership is committed to reviewing cases and to correcting an injustice if it occurs. Uh, so I don't think it matters if you're in Mississippi or if you're in New York City. If you, you know, don't have that leadership in the district attorney's office, you know, you can have a harder time where you would least expect it. Said in, you know, our, our Supreme Court has said, you know, prosecutor's job is to do justice, not just to obtain a criminal conviction. And that, um, you know, unfortunately, you know, for many prosecutors, I don't think that that really resonates. I mean, I've had cases where, um, you know, in New Jersey, where I, you know, we had concrete proof of a client's innocence and had a prosecutor say to me, why would I ever vacate this conviction? Do you know how hard it is to obtain a conviction in this county? And I said, well, you would you would help vacate the conviction because it's the right thing to do when he's innocent. And so, you know, it's, I think that also, you know, it's amazing to me as part of our training of law students, we always take them to a prison and we have them look at what is it like to live in prison? What are these conditions? You know, the glimpse that we can get from a tour. Sure. And, you know, it's amazing to me that prosecutors are, you're sending people to prison, are not required to visit prisons. And many of them don't even have an idea. And it's very, you know, easy when you're working on one side. You know, recently a prosecutor I work with in New Jersey in Mercer County invited me to speak to his law, you know, law class that he was teaching. And I brought um, Gerard Richardson, who had been exonerated, and his brother Kevin Richardson. And afterwards, you know, the prosecutor expressed appreciation because he never saw that emotional side. He never had that connection because he works with victims and, um, you know, these are victims of the system, but in another way. And so it's easy to be desensitized and to not really, you know, view people as humans when you don't have that interaction or understanding. I'm not sure exactly how to fix it, but I think that's a big issue opportunity in Latin America, which is something I think we can learn from in this country, is they are not as adversarial. Now, there's a downside to that in that sometimes there's not aggressive advocacy going on, but the upside is that prosecutors and defense attorneys and police aren't always at each other. So when I go do a training in Latin America, often the room is half filled with defense attorneys, half filled with prosecutors, prison wardens show up, chief of police shows up. And that was startling to me in the beginning, because I'm so used to in this country that there's defense attorney conferences, and prosecutor conferences, and police, and they don't all get together. And that, that creates tremendous opportunity.
for this conversation, like, what are the issues with identification? Can we make changes? Isn't it in all our best interests that we get the right person? And if you get those people in the room together, you can make those changes. And, and that's a problem in this country. And I think I see it so clearly because, you know, I literally cross the border constantly and it's a totally different culture. And, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's one of the good things about a class system. And I say that extremely cautiously because I'd say 99% of things are bad about a class system. But one of the good things is they, all these lawyers went to law school together. They all hang out. They have that kind of relationship that you can have these kinds of conversations. Now, again, the downside is sometimes that makes the advocacy not that aggressive, but it does create some opportunities.